so I'm catching up on some some uh, comments that some of my users have had here on the channel. One of them wanted me to cover GNU Herd. And so today we're going to talk about the story of GNU Herd. Yes, <laughs> stay tuned right after this. What does herd stand for anyway? Where'd they come up with that name? So herd is kind of a dual purpose name. Also has a little bit of recursion in it. Herd stands for the herd of Unix replacing daemons, except it's H-I-R-D. The herd part stands for herd of interfaces representing depth. So it's kind of a circular acronym. And this was coined by Thomas Bushnell, who was the primary architect of herd on the original uh, project way back in the, in the uh, early 80s. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about some of its origins, what it was for, and why, why Herd exists. So most of the software that was developed by GNU was done from scratch, and there were some pieces that weren't. But they were trying to build a, a free version of Unix. That was their, that was their goal. And the, the GNU project was started on September the 27th, 1983 by Richard Stallman. So they were putting together all these utilities that Unix had. And, and at the time that they were working on this, Unix had hundreds of utilities. Uh, and so they had developed the compilers. They had developed the uh, editors. They had developed the file system tools. They had developed a bunch of utilities that, that Unix had. But they lacked one thing, and that was a kernel. So, but they were able to get some pieces they didn't do themselves. Like, for example, they didn't develop X Windows System, and they didn't develop Tech. Those all came with free licenses at the time, and so they were incorporated into the GNU solution. They did not have a kernel to be able to do anything with it and actually distribute all these tools as a system. So that was one of the things they needed. Now, MIT, which is where uh, Richard Stallman had originally worked, and he left his job at MIT in order to prevent MIT from claiming uh, ownership of the software that GNU was developing. So MIT had an operating system that they had developed in the 1970s called Trix. And that was developed by Professor Stephen Ward, and so they thought, well, this might be a, an interesting, you know, kernel to be able to use because it was kind of Unix-like. It had some things that kind of looked Unix-y. But uh, so in 1986, uh, Richard Stallman and his team tried to use Trix, but they saw that it wasn't going to work. It just, it just didn't have what they needed in order to create a Unix-like uh, operating system, which is what their goal was. In 1987, GNU looked at 4.4 BSD-like kernel. And what's kind of interesting, because had they gone that way, this world that we live in today could have looked completely different than the one it does now. Uh, it's one of those, what we call a crossroads in time. So if GNU had gone... 4.4 BSD Lite, which did have a, a free license at that time, uh, they could have, uh, that could have changed everything. Uh, you know, Linux would not exist. At least it might exist as a hobbyist operating system, but it would not be the size that it is today. On the suggestion of Richard Stallman, the GNU project decided to use Carnegie Mellon's University's mock kernel. Mach was, was uh, a revolutionary new kernel that was designed as a microkernel, and that was developed by Richard Rashid and Avi Tevanen. Tevanen. Uh, both of those two guys worked to develop a brand new operating system. So what was the goal of this thing? Why was Mach invented? Well, the reason was is that uh, the Carnegie Mellon University team felt that the, the, the uh, kernels that were like Unix was getting too bloated. They, they carried the device drivers. They carried all this, this stuff, file system code and schedulers and interprocess communication and virtual memory and scheduling. They carried all this stuff 
in the system part of the uh, security onion. And so they wanted to peel all that off, move it out to the application space where really it really belonged. I mean, there's no question that what they were talking about doing made sense. And there was a lot of people that were like, wow, this is pretty cool. And so everybody was keenly interested in what was going on with Mach at the time. However, in 1987, they couldn't start using Mach kernel right away on the GNU project. Why? CMU didn't have a license that was suitable for GNU to use. There wasn't a free license to the software. And so the GNU team was worried that, if the, hey, if they started using this thing and CMU said, uh-uh, we're going to own it, you, and then they would have had to been out looking for a new kernel. So they didn't do anything. Uh, for three years until that whole issue was resolved. Finally, CMU did come out with a suitable license in 1990, and so the, the GNU herd team actually began work then. Well, a year later in 1991, Linus Torvalds had released the Linux kernel, and the application suite developed by GNU was being moved over to Linux in order to provide Linux with the compilers and utilities and editors and all the things that it was going to need. We now had GNU slash Linux as our, as our mechanism. It kind of languished again for another 10 years. And there are a number of, of projects that have picked up uh, GNU Herd. One of the ones is Debian. Arch has picked it up. Gentoo did too, but now Gentoo's version of the of Herd is discontinued. They no longer support it. But Arch and uh, Debian still do. They still have. Uh, in fact, uh, as we'll see later, Debian actually has a very recent port of it as well. So, you know, because of all these problems, and they weren't getting anywhere, they were, you know, they were kind of stuck. So they started investing, the team started investigating replacing the mock kernel with something like L4, which had, uh, it was a very fast, uh, uh, a very fast micro kernel. And uh, there was also a variant of that called L4 sec, which had security uh, pieces in it. There was a, the problem that I remember with mock was, in a normal Unix uh, runtime, when an application starts, it only has one user owner. And, but GNU Herd can have multiple user owners. Now, you might think, oh, wait a minute, how's this, why is that? Well, as users basically sign on to start using these services, their user identities get added on to the runtime for that system. So... You're basically, when you're calling a service, you're basically logging in to use it. So that's kind of along the lines of the way that uh, Plan 9 did things. There was also some investigations in uh, Kyotos. Um, and uh, those, all of those things, L4, L4Sec, and uh, Kyotos, all concluded that this was going to require major rework of herd in order to be able to replace the mock kernel with one of those. So that was sort of abandoned. That I ideas were sort of abandoned. In 2007, the herd developers Neil Walford and Marcus Brinkman wrote a critique of the herd architecture in which in 10 pages or so, they called out all of these issues, all of these design problems, and all of these things which were barriers to completing the project successfully. Um, and I and that if you can go out to the GNU Herd website under the uh, GNU pages, uh, where you'll see all these listed. So in 2008, Neil Walfer uh, Field kind of drifted off and started working on Vengos, which was a microkernel and had a modern native kernel as a modern native kernel for Herd. But he paused that work in 2009 because he no longer had the time to work on it. So after years of stagnation, the development of GNU Herd began up and started up again in 2015 and 2016. And there was actually four releases that were produced in that year year long time frame. So uh, there was uh, the GNU Geeks, G U I X, Geeks. Uh, it was a Linux distribution that it was announced that had been ported uh, that had 
taken in GNU herd in August of 2015, and they actually got it to run. So what what was the deal here? Wait a minute, I, I don't understand. I mean, the mock kernel is that's you that was used successfully by Next OS and and it then became part of the Mac OS 10. Uh, based systems, those were all and still are, well, at least for the Mac OS part, those are still based on the mock kernel, right? So how come they succeeded and the GNU herd plotted along for 30 years without producing a production system that was adopted widely? Well, the Steve Jobs hired Avi Tevinen from the very beginning. They, he got the guy that, uh, one of the guys that actually wrote the software and so he brought him into Next, and Avi recommended going with the hybrid microkernel and not a full-up microkernel because he was aware of the issues that CMU uh, Mach was running into uh, and also uh, GNU Herd was running into. So this is my opinion. This is not going to be shared by others, I'm sure. But the fact that Next Computer did not attempt to integrate the full mock kernel and they also integrated it with 4.3 BSD, that seems to indicate that the hybrid approach was, was successful. And that was part of the reason for its success was they actually said, well, wait a minute, we, we don't want to do a full up microkernel. That's just not going to work. And we know where the problems, we know where the bodies are buried, as they say, because Avi knew where the problems were from CMU's work with it. So, our, what is, so what does that leave us right now with uh, with uh, GNU Herd? So Arch Herd is actively maintained. Debian GNU Herd is actively maintained. In fact, they have a release they published in 2021. Uh, Geeks remains under development, and they also have the uh, GNU Herd available. It, it does, I can tell you that it does take quite a bit of of ramp up time and a, a pretty huge learning curve to understand how GNU herd works. It's more than just it's more than just a microkernel. They are actually doing things like uh, they're doing uh, translation services and they're mapping file systems onto things that we would normally have said were things like. This is an FTP transfer. This is an HTTP transfer. They were actually mapping functionality onto the file system. Again, kind of following or kind of leading Plan 9. And, and, and yeah, Plan 9 did a lot of those things too. Always easier to start from the ground up and build something than it is to try to integrate some two things together that weren't designed to be together in the first place. And, and that's a story that I learned a long time ago. When I worked for Burroughs, back then the hardware engineers sat on one side of the hall, the software engineers sat on another side of the hall, and they were not allowed to talk to each other, even though it was only a space of six feet that separated them. Finally, Burroughs learned that they weren't going to get anywhere unless the hardware and the software teams worked together in tandem. Once they did that, then the operating system guys, the application guys, and the hardware guys were all in the same room. The software guys weren't have to, didn't have to adapt their software to run on hardware, and the hardware guys didn't have to add in bolt-ons to accommodate the software people because their designs hadn't included those things to begin with. So all of a sudden, you had an integrated product from the ground up. That, that is where Burroughs got their performance. That is where Burroughs got their ability to hang things together very well, was by making sure those two teams were always working together in tandem. The same would have been true for Herd had Herd stayed with their original notion of building the operating system and the kernel together, but they didn't. Uh, and they were trying to integrate something written by another team which had different design goals, thinking this would be the path forward. And as it turned out, it wasn't. Is that criticizing them? No. We have all been there. I mean, I've been there several times where I've painted myself in a corner very similar to this. Uh, in the current state, of GNU herd, it would appear 
that GNU Herd has not been updated since 2015. Now, I'm talking about the website, not the, not the software. But it would appear that there's been no updates as of the state of GNU Herd since 2015. And in fact, the last usability report on GNU Herd that's on their website is from 2013. Uh, that would indicate to me that the program is dormant. Uh, and uh, that doesn't mean it's dead. It just means there's nobody actively working on it at the moment. Now, according to the webpage, it says, you know, hey, if you're interested in, in reviving this and you want to solve our issues, come on down and fix it. What to do? Well, Mach 3 was the last developed kernel released by CMU in 1990. That's a long time ago. Uh, yeah, they CMU went done. I mean, they walked away from it. Uh, the mock kernel was chosen by OSF1, Next Step. Uh, IBM's Workspace OS also picked it. Apple, before they purchased Next, was actually independently trying to build across platform versions of their Mac OS. Now, that's the previous generation Mac OS. Not Mac, don't confuse it with Mac OS 10 or what is currently called Mac OS. This was the one prior. And so they were trying to create one that was cross-platform. And so they had adopted Mach already to do that and were working on I think it was called Mach 10 uh, or something like that, or Mac 10 or something. But yeah, uh, that was what Apple was working on. So what about my take on all of this? What do I think uh, about GNU Herd? So first of all, the, the microkernel, uh, every microkernel, um, pure microkernel I have ever read about, with the exception of a few, there are a few that have been successful, but they're very small and they have very specific purposes in which they're being used. Uh, but the hybrid microkernel seems to have been proven successful, at least in the cases of NextOS and, the, and also in Apple's Mac OS. So, and tbOS, watchOS, iOS, all of those things. So, Mach was successfully integrated uh, with 4.2 BSD and 4.3 BSD. So there's a model there for integration with those two, those two distributions. The Mach, so how did things end up with Mach uh, at the CMU project? The Mach kernel turned out to be larger than the original Unix kernel. So they didn't quite meet their goals either. They were trying to develop a kernel that was smaller than the Unix kernel, and they ended up having to make it larger. GNU Herd might be sal salvageable, but, you know, my take on it is it probably is going to have to be re-architected from the ground up. And, and especially if they're going to look at anything modern. And, and the reason I say that is, is, is very simply this. Uh, f first of all, you have the Linux kernel, uh, and that was the problem that GNU was trying to solve, right? They needed to have a kernel that would, they could release together with their utilities to form a distribution. So if, if that was the original reason for GNU, GNU Herd, then the project is done because they, they, they actually fixed it by uh, using the Linux kernel and then using their utilities to put it around it. And so they solved the original problem to begin with, and GNU Herd is no longer needed. However, I understand pride of development. I mean, I, yes, I understand that. Uh, yeah, I, I once had that pride of development in, uh, in when, when I was working with a customer. And, uh, yeah, I got over it. You, you got to do what's right. You know, you have, if this, I mean, if this had been a corporate-sponsored uh, project, I, I would think it would probably have been canceled long before 30 years I think they would have. I think they would have cut that puppy loose a long time ago, and stopped the uh, expenditure of money to try to support it. So, however, you know, people that come from academic settings, they have a different view on things. Uh, they look at it as that this is research, this is learning, this is stuff that we need to keep around because who knows, it might be valuable someday for maybe research purposes, maybe for redirection purposes, and that, he, might, you know, Stallman might be exactly right on that. I'm not from that world. I'm from a different world. 
uh, even though I did start out in the academic world, we were still trying to solve real world problems. And so we had real world expectations that we had to meet. So I've never been involved with that blue sky stuff where, you know, hey, it's okay. Just keep spending money on it whenever. It doesn't matter uh, as long as you've got something to do and you can, you can, you know, you can justify your existence. GNU Herd, I've, I've, I think, needs to adopt a hybrid approach. Uh, we already know that's been successful. That's probably going to mean that you're going to have to redo the architecture inside of the core herd uh, uh, code. What needs to happen here probably is go back to the critique that uh, Walfeld uh, wrote and, and, and Brinkman wrote and look at that hard and say, okay, so what do we really need to do to get you heard in order to adapt? a new type of unikernel to this because mock isn't supported anymore. There's nobody creating code at CMU for mock. Uh, it's that's a, that project is dead. The only company that is doing work with mock is Apple. Uh, and you know, the original version of their OSF one Mark 7.3 or whatever it was called, uh, it, that went into Xenu. I mean, that's long. <laughs> I'm sure that that code doesn't look anything like what it looks like today. You have to be off the wall and, and ask the impossible questions sometimes and just see if somebody goes, oh, I think I could build that. Because uh, you never know, right? You never know until you try. And that's important that you should remember that. It's You never know until you put your paper and your pencil down and you start you start actually doing the work. Get off of the design and go try, trying to build it. That's when you really find out if what you're trying to do will work or not. Because you quickly are going to realize, hey, this is, I can't make this work. It's not work. It's not going together. But yeah, anyway, that's all I had for today. Hope you enjoyed this take on GNU Herd. Hope it answered some of your questions. I'm sure it probably opened more. If, uh, if you want to share what you think about the project, what, what should be done, let me know in a comment below. I'd love to hear your opinion. I hope to see you all again soon. Bye for now.